Okay, we're there. Good afternoon. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Not complain. Thank you again for your willingness to chat with me. I really appreciate this. Uh, may I ask you please to tell us your name? Sure. My name is Carl Horvath. Thank you so much. And will you share a little bit about yourself, anything you feel comfortable sharing, whether you want to talk about your career, your education, where you grew up, whatever you want to talk about. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, well, uh, my, my history uh, is, is uh, one that uh, is not a straight line. It uh, has taken many turns over the, over the years. Uh, but, um, you know, my story is that I, I grew up uh, in, in, in uh, an environment that uh, really didn't value higher education at all. In fact, uh, they were very much against it. And uh, so I started out life um, as a uh, uh, blue collar worker and had a, you know, uh, a job and, uh, you know, started having a family and, and, and progressed along. And at one point I said to myself, you know, I, I just have some questions about things and I'd like to learn more. And so I wound up in a community college evening class and uh, I just wanted to take a course and uh, it was transformational for me at that point. I, I just you know, I said, oh my gosh, I've been missing this. Uh, I, I can't believe everything that I'm learning. Uh, I have to get more. And so I, I quit my job uh, and I, I took another job where I could work evenings and weekends and go to school full time. And, and that's what I did. I went through community college, transferred to Temple University uh, in Philadelphia, which is just a great school and uh, I, I was served very well by the community college and by Temple who didn't assume that I was just a typical student uh, that was uh, coming to complete their four years and move on. Um, and, and uh, you know, I just couldn't let go of education. I, I uh, continued to work in it as well. Um, I went to school for art uh, originally uh, to be an artist and in school discovered these things called computers and uh, boy I just uh, used my left and right brain after that and uh, wound up being in information technology specifically higher education technology for a long time so uh, I, for a long time I've worked at uh, many uh, higher ed institutions everything from large public institutions of tens of thousands of students to uh, small privates uh, of a couple thousand and everything in between over the years. And uh, it's uh, been quite a journey. And all along, uh, I, I've always kept learning. You know, I wanted to learn more. So I, I kept taking classes and, and, and uh, moving on and getting more degrees because I was there. You know, once you're in school, uh, you do get assistance with getting some of your, your uh, school. And I, I took advantage of that because not so much for the degrees, but because, uh, you know, I wanted to, to learn everything about it. And each degree challenged me more, like the doctorate and then the ma master's and the doctorate. I mean, just more of a challenge. And I just love that. So um, I left uh, last year to join a nonprofit consortium that helps higher education institutions now. And instead of working at one institution at a time, I get to work with them all over the country. And it's, uh, it's just a great job. And uh, I get to lead the, uh, the nonprofit and talk to people every day, not just all over uh, US, but outside of the US too. So uh, that's, my, that's my story so far. And you're sticking to it, right? I'm sticking to it, yes, yes. I love it. Uh, I think that uh, it's very interesting when you described your education. Um, I think we have a little different path. Uh, uh, I started out in IT when I was 17. I got my first oh. job working on mainframe computers as a punch card operator, whatever that might have been back then. But uh, I didn't have any education. Uh, all I had was experience. So over the years, I grew, promoted, grew, promoted. But uh, I ran up against my... Uh, my nemesis, if you will, when I came to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill as a director of IT for the School of Medicine. And uh, the School of Medicine and the health system were considering merging. And uh, I was sitting in a room with a whole bunch of alphabets. They had every alphabet in the entire alphabet spectrum on the back of their names. And um, I remember one of the gentlemen asked me, he says, who are you to tell me this cannot be done? 
And it really sparked something in me to go get an education. And I, I think I got the same bug that you did. It just became such a phenomenal thing to continue learning. So that's really, really helpful for you to share that. So in your process of learning, did you have a thought along the way as you were getting these educations that this is what I want to do for a career? Or was it kind of like, you know, as you went along, you found your way into your career? How, how did you uh, make that transition? Right. So that, that's an interesting question because uh, it's funny. It's, it's like they say, the more you know, the less you know. And, 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 and that's how I, I really felt, uh, you know, education for me unlocked the world. You know, when you grow up in a family or a neighborhood or a community that doesn't embrace, you know, the, the entire uh, world, you know, there's, there, there, there's such richness out there. I mean, of course there's good and bad, uh, but, but uh, you know, people are wonderful, other cultures are wonderful, and that's what I really, uh, getting into uh, higher education exposed me to that and more. It gave me that opportunity, it opened my mind, as I said, it transformed me into this awareness of the world that to this day, I'm just in amazement and, and, and wonder of, of, of everything. It just made me value my life and our us, you know, as human beings and the planet we live on just it really uh, it's never ceases to amaze me. And every day is a surprise and very interesting. The other thing that, that it really did for me in, in understanding about the world is that there are different people in the world in different conditions, you know, as bad as you think you have it, uh, other people have it worse, and then some people have it better. So that was uh, a good thing to learn about and be exposed to, um, especially when I, you know, worked, worked uh, attended Temple University, uh, you know, my school was in North Philadelphia and, you know, I was exposed to other cultures and communities down there and over time, you know, got out into the community. So, I mean, anywhere I go, when I travel, I always want to move around. I don't want to stay in a conference center or in a hotel somewhere. I want to get into the community, learn about the people. It doesn't matter where I go. And same thing for work. Uh, really want to engage with the community, uh, get to know them better too. So, I, I, I did that, and uh, one of the big things that I, I started working on, and this is a long time ago, uh, is is uh, especially in the city of Philadelphia, there's a uh, there's uh, a thing called digital divide, uh, which is I'm sure you know about having been in IT. Uh, but uh, back in the 90s, we there was a big initiative by the city of Philadelphia, and it just started again with the current CIO. Uh, in Philadelphia, where, uh, you know, the idea was to bring internet access to some neighborhoods that were, you know, didn't have it. Um, and so, you know, when you think about your Verizon uh, Fios server service, and you talk to people and you say, uh, oh, what do you have, Comcast or Verizon? And, oh, we have Comcast, you know, because they won't, uh, Verizon hasn't run that fiber into our neighborhood yet. And, you know, it's just, yeah, I got to suffer with Comcast, suffer with Comcast. When you think about some of the neighborhoods in, uh, you know, in, in the city, and then also some of the neighborhoods in rural, like I'm in Pennsylvania, in rural Pennsylvania, they don't have anything. They don't have any lines that run to them, the fiber, uh, to, they, they can't even think about Comcast or Verizon or internet access. And, and so uh, that was a project I uh, really opened my eyes back then many years ago and, and really stuck with that over these years. And so, uh, the, you know, just like the world, just like learning about the world, um, it really opened my eyes to not just the digital divide, because then that led into me learning about techno racism, uh, which is a whole nother field. Uh, that is really starting to open up now and getting more awareness finally. Um, and, and part of that is because of Black Lives Matter and the attention that's going on with, uh, you know, uh, the issues in the news. But uh, this stuff's been there all along and no one has really brought this to the surface for discussion uh, in, 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 a, in, in, the, in the larger, uh, you know, uh, public eye. You know, there's organizations, uh, there is uh, uh, Princeton. I mean, uh, th th there's a great book uh, by Ruha Benjamin, who's an African-American studies professor at uh, Princeton. 
I believe she she wrote a, a book called Race After Technology, and uh, I think it was 2019. And uh, you know, uh, th this just really got me. You know, this this book because in the book she talks about uh, uh, about you know the Jim Crow laws. You know, we had the Jim Crow laws. So a lot of people know about Jim Crow. She uses a term called Jim Code. You know, which I thought was a great play on words, but what a great point it makes. And it, the book is about technology, which is my area. I mean, there's so much to embrace, you know, in terms of diversity in in the world. You know, where do you start? I mean, really, I mean, it, it's it's overwhelming. Um, and and so I figured I would stick with what I know, which is the technology part. And, 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 and work with that. So I have joined some organizations uh, telling people about this book and these concepts like Jim Code, you know, and, and just a little bit about Jim Code. Uh, again, we don't realize it, especially people who have designed it. You design based on your experiences uh, and yourself a lot of times. A lot of design is not, uh, does not embrace uh, the, the entirety of this of society, you know, it's it's very centric to the designers, and so uh, there's a there's a program on uh, on CNN now called United Shades of America, uh, and uh, it's on Sunday nights. Last week, I think it was, there was a program, uh, and the comedian or the the, the MC uh, uh, Kamel, Bell. Kamel Bell, right, went to Atlanta. And, and he tried some virtual reality and, and he says, well, you can set yourself up to be, you know, who you are in the virtual reality. And, and he got in there and, uh, you know, he saw himself uh, from the, 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 you know, second person view uh, of being uh, like a black man. Uh, and then when he looked down at his hands, they were white, you know? So it's just like, who designed this? Who, who, who designed this system? You know, uh, obviously there's a bias, you know, kind of built in on these things. So I think that uh, what, what I'm interested in is really going back, uh, going forward, you know, by, by in, you know, intelligent design uh, and making sure that we design for everybody. Um, there, you know, I, I found this out in teaching over the years that, my students, you know, everybody thinks millennials and Gen Zs, they're, they're great with technology. They're just so good. But having taught hundreds, probably thousands of students over the years, not everybody, and, and sometimes a lot of, uh, about technology, many of them don't know technology and they're just people too, you know? So they, they don't know how to embrace it. Um, so you have to make sure that you design for everybody. And, and that is really what I've been focused on, you know, in the past uh, years, a uh, few years. The job that I have now allows me to connect with a lot of schools, uh, community colleges, K through 12s that are under-resourced and serve underserved populations, uh, a lot of minority populations. And so I love working with them and trying to get them the technology that they need. Uh, it's you know, it's available to for-profits. Uh, they can invest their money in technology, but I just spoke to a school district yesterday in Texas that said, uh, you know, we, we have nothing and there's no support. The grants uh, are not forthcoming from the state. We know that the higher education institutions are getting money, that the government agencies are getting money, but they're really not helping the K through 12s. And so working with them and their population is an underserved population. Uh, so, so, you know, it's, it's closing that digital divide. It's ensuring that the, the programming of, of applications is done in an unbiased way and that is inclusive. I mean, when you think about, uh, you, you know, an, another example is, is, uh, are the algorithms that are used in programming. It's, and I'm sure you're aware of uh, the coding, you know, uh, and, but, but it's written from, uh, again, the designer's perspective, uh, their, their influences, and, and, and uh, that, that's all kind of built in to the algorithms. This affects also, uh, you know, things like finance applications and real estate applications for people of color. You know, there are uh, 
you know, uh, you talk about coding in our society, you know, and I, I read about this too, the coding uh, of, you know, if you, you have a, a application, you know, for a loan and, and you look at John Smith or Tyrone Jackson, you know, there are judgments made about that. So take that concept and apply it to coding, you know, uh, again, this comes across in, in the applications we use. It comes across also in facial recognition. That's been in the news recently. Also, there was somebody that uh, was sent to prison because of an inaccurate facial recognition match recently. They just got out of prison, but unjustly arrested. And I put my, I try to put myself in that place. You know, again, I, you know, I come from, you know, initially years of unawareness as a young person, you know, uh, having been born who I am uh, into, you know, luckily getting into education and learning about the world and about everybody, you know? So at, at that, at that point, um, you know, you can put yourself in the place of others and think, man, what if I was that person that was arrested from the wrong facial recognition, uh, identification, and then actually put in prison and then they go, Oh, never mind. Sorry. We made a mistake. And then let you out. Like, you know, how many people have to worry about that and how many people, it doesn't even cross their mind that that will happen, right? So again, going back to the, the applications that we design, you know, we have to be very careful. If they're designed to recognize uh, lighter scholar, color skin faces as opposed to darker color skin faces. I think that's a huge problem and we can't use something like that as a tool for law enforcement. It's a great idea but it is not uh, fair, you know? So anyway, I'll just stop, pause there for a moment. Sorry, I don't get me started on this. So uh, I, I, I think I was asking you more about your own personal career, but I do wanna say a, a couple of things about some of the things you said. So first I'll go back to the digital divide. The digital divide has been around since the internet was first proposed. It's always been very mm -hmm. much it leaning toward the more wealthy, more affluent people than it is those that are not. And in the midst of COVID, it's really evident that we need to do something. And a lot of people have spoke about the bill that Biden produced, uh, uh, is promoting yeah. about uh, infrastructure. But in order to address whatever the inequities are uh, in technology, for children in rural and poor areas, you know, riding off Wi-Fi or hot spots or all these things to do your lessons. This seems like an awfully cruel way to do that. And yet mm -hmm. we want to punish them and say, well, you know, they aren't participating or they aren't doing this. You've got to do more about the system before you can start correcting people's behavior because if the system isn't built yeah. for them, then, you know, how can you criticize that? I want to say, you know, in response to the uh, thing with the uh, United Shades of America, so uh, when Google came out with their facial recognition software in 2015, every time it saw a black person, they put a picture of a gorilla. We've got so many issues wow. within our society as a whole that I don't think in my lifetime, and I'm pretty old, but in my lifetime, we will correct these because I think some of them are fundamentally tied in how we see each other. You know, So if I am simply a black or colored or inward, then we are going to fix these problems because we really can't because we're too busy stuck on the things that really don't matter. Um, we as human beings really need to think about being human as opposed to what color or what size or whatever we are. Yeah. We love our labels. For some reason, we love labels. And so that matters. But but I think one of the interesting things I want to go back and talk about. So you talked about, um, you know, early on in your career and what you do now in your campus consortium. So uh, how do you work with historically black colleges and mm -hmm. small, small, uh, less financially uh, fit colleges? How, do you, how does your work cover those and what do you do for those organizations? Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. In fact, uh, last year uh, we ran a campaign for HBCUs and uh, we had uh, quite a few. We, we worked with uh, a few of them and uh, we, we have worked with one now. In fact, I just spoke to the CIO there at Lemoyne Owen. Um, and, uh, you know, there we, we have what the, these are called the, uh, grant campaigns or in-kind grant campaigns, which is basically funding uh, that is given to one of our partners to decrease the cost for the schools. And so there was a grant campaign that we ran for HBCU specifically. This was before, right before COVID because we did a whole COVID uh, you know, campaign as well. 
um, but they were targeted to HBCUs and we have another one coming up uh, probably later this year. Um, but uh, the idea is uh, to bring uh, technology that, especially to small and medium sized schools, and, and there are many that are struggling in today's environment, uh, higher ed environment, especially, uh, you know, schools of a uh, few students and they're struggling to survive. Um, but, uh, you know, they have to compete. And when you think about today's students, uh, many of whom are, you know, used to digital uh, interaction as opposed to generations ago where we would go outside and, you know, we wouldn't spend as much time uh, in the digital environment. But, you know, if you think about healthcare, uh, you think uh, health care applications, you think about finance and banking applications, uh, you think about retail and recreation of, of, of uh, younger people today, uh, they get to a college or a university, and especially a, a small one that is struggling, uh, you know, they don't have the resources to provide uh, portals, websites, uh, identity and access management, security, right, for, for their students. Um, so, so that's what the organization I work uh, with now uh, provides is financial assistance against by partnering with these uh, ed tech companies uh, that uh, provide enterprise cloud services uh, at uh, prices that can be afforded. It really reduces the cost. So uh, it's, it's so minimal, it's a no brainer and it's sustained over time. So if it's a term of three to five years or however long uh, that is sustained for that period of time. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that we do. The other thing I, I do is I just reach out to anybody that we've worked with and, and I invite anybody uh, through the organization to just meet with me. I'm happy to give free advice uh, I, I, you know, get on a call. Uh, it's a, it's objective. Uh, I've got a lot of experience, and I, I love to share that uh, with with schools. Uh, we also have uh, managed services uh, uh, that that will come in and do some assessments. You know, so we can tell you if your uh, applications are accessible, or if your IT uh, department is running efficiently, and or if we can, you know, try to help uh, advise on how to make it more efficient. Uh, so those are some of the things that we do for for schools at no charge or to try to decrease the costs. So a lot of uh, of these tech companies have been giving money and providing resources to these colleges uh, during this this pandemic. Um, and, and a lot of that has been very helpful. So my, I have three degrees from a historically black college here in North Carolina, and I love my college with everything because they were everything to me to spur on my desire to learn. But, but what's really interesting is when they give these funds, it's like they make a deposit and then they walk away without actually following right. to see how those funds have been managed and to see that those funds are going in places. So like it's, it's more than just giving money and advice, but it's like sticking around and helping them work through the different pieces and parts of whatever they are trying to do within the organization. And I think you probably could speak to this as well. You know, in, in the current age, we saw the pipeline hat but universities, uh, regardless of their type and, and size, are are constantly being uh, fished or or yeah. you know, at least somebody looking yeah. for ways to break in and collect their data. Uh, how do you help with that? What are the things that your organization does in that space? Yeah. Uh, that that's a that's a great question. And as a CIO in, in a few higher eds before this uh, job, I you know absolutely identify with what you're saying because I would walk into some of these uh, smaller to medium sized schools and uh, zero security. There's nobody attending to it. There's maybe the network person who's uh, thinking about it once in a while. Uh, but as we all know, phishing attacks, ransomware, that has really escalated over the past uh, few years. And uh, now you have to have dedicated resources for that. And a lot of uh, schools are not prepared for that. They don't have the staffing or the expertise for that. So one of the things uh, that we uh, have is a partner that we work with that provides these kinds of services. First of all, there's IT vulnerability assessment. So if they come in, they will look at the entire organization, do a prior list of priorities, P1, P2, P3. These are the things you gotta take care of immediately because they're glaring security issues. And then uh, uh, there's also uh, mitigation service to help fix these things. 
And then also there is a SOC, which is a security operations center service. Again, all assisted by campus consortium along with the partner. So we lower that cost so the organizations can afford it. But the SOC is 24 seven, 365. So they can monitor their environment all the time uh, instead of waiting for the one IT person to come in eight to five Monday through Friday. And then a phishing attack happens at two o'clock in the morning or on the weekends and you can't address it. So the security operations center service is, is also there. And so that's one of the things campus has done is look for these, uh, you know, you're under, uh, you, you're under budget, you're understaffed and you don't, and you're, uh, you have lack of expertise in your organization. Here's some enterprise system solutions to help you survive and compete in this uh, very competitive market. Yeah, that, that's, that's very helpful. So, uh, what is the difference between what your organization does and what uh, Educause does? How is it different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Educause is a great organization. I have uh, been working with them for, for many years, uh, but they are really more theoretical and bigger picture. Uh, I think Campus Consortium is very specific to technology and the technical part of the solution. And, and uh, while we do address uh, with policy, uh, we do address, um, you know, operations uh, and, and other issues. Um, we uh, also focus solely on the solution because we want to be results oriented. We want to see direct outcomes within a certain amount of time. So a school will be struggling, let's say, with the admissions process or the enrollment process, getting their students onboarded. Um, and, and so we uh, have a solution through our partners that they can implement that will automate that process. So, you know, you don't have to track down the person who's making email accounts or providing credentials to access the student portal. It's all automated. Um, so, so those are the, the, the types of specific solutions uh, that Campus Consortium provides. Uh, along with, you know, we try to do some research as well. We give uh, monthly educational talks um, uh, online uh, webinars. And, um, you know, we also have work groups. I'll be having a conference this year, you know, trying to build community uh, so we can share. That's the difference between higher ed and for profit, I think, is that higher ed is really much more willing to share, even though we're competing for the same students in, in a lot of cases. We're happy to help each other uh, in, in terms of these technology solutions. And that's what campus does. It really focuses on solutions and results and making sure that we fix pain points that schools have. And you think that's different than what Educause does? I think that uh, when you go to Educause, I've been to a lot of uh, Educause conferences. Uh, it, it's great, but it's, it's big. And uh, there's lots of solutions there. Um, we are hands-on and uh, eventually you can get connected to vendors, you know, that attend Educause, uh, but we are targeting more the small to medium-sized schools, not the, you know, not that we won't work with the large schools, but we know that campus knows there's a need for these schools that are struggling and may not survive. And so that's where our focus is on and we try to specialize in those areas. And that's why we're also trying to work with K through 12s. It's another marginalized educational system that is just struggling mightily, uh, especially in the area of technology because of the expense and expertise is so unavailable to these institutions. Absolutely. And I, I agree with you very much. And thank you very much for the distinction, because that's really, really helpful. Because uh, uh, I belong to Educause, and I find they have tremendous number of resources. Now, a lot of these smaller schools and disadvantaged schools may not have a membership with Educause, because it's not right. cheap to be a member of Educause. It's not. It used to be that yeah. price went up. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So do you charge uh, people to be uh, a member of the campus consortium? How, how do people become members? And what does that do for them? What do they get? Um, you know, basically, uh, we do have a, a structure of pricing on our website. Uh, I think for a school that's like, uh, you know, a thousand students, it's $50 or something. I mean, it's not a, a lot of money. And listen, if a school comes to me and makes the case and say, like, we are, we are just at the end, we just get, of course, I'm going to invite them in and work with them uh, and, and, and not turn them away because they can't afford a membership fee. So yeah, we do have to keep the lights on, you know, so we, 
we we need a a, a little bit of cash to do that but uh you know we never turn anyone away uh for uh the lack of a membership fee uh we also have uh through our partners we do get some funding uh so uh we we work with them and that helps us you know operate as a as an organization okay that's that's very helpful thank you so much for that so uh, where do you see the future for it in higher education yeah, future of IT, it's definitely got to change. It's, uh, in, 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 you know, especially in higher education. Uh, you, you know, I think uh, what, what's happened so many uh, years ago that the, the academy is so used to, um, you know, uh, student services, academics, uh, even uh, financial uh, operations, uh, and even advancement has become such a critical part uh, you know, development uh, alumni, you know, of, of, of institutions. Uh, but uh, IT is kind of newer, you know, for, for higher ed. And sometimes they're not sure, I don't think, what to do with it. You know, where does it fit? But IT technology is woven into the fabric of every organization today. And uh, you really need to think about it strategically and uh, consider it at a high level. Uh, but uh, it should be assisting the mission not taking over the mission, but since it's such an integral part of the mission, uh, you have to make sure you're using it effectively and you're not wasting money on it. I think the, uh, the, there's a lot of catch up for higher education. And I think COVID, uh, the pandemic recently has certainly, uh, you know, uh, forced institutions into, uh, you know, get, getting on board with uh, more aggressively using online learning, more aggressively creating a mobile workforce, schools that, would never consider having people work from home. Are you kidding me? You come to campus and hit your office every day. That's it. Well, now suddenly, you know, that that week in March of 2020, nobody was on campus. You had to be at home. Uh, so, so a lot of schools had to pivot very quickly. And how well they did that, uh, well, part of that meant uh, what their technology infrastructure was like. But even if that was good, what was their culture like, their work culture? And how were they able to, uh, you, you know, a lot of schools are great with the on, on ground, face-to-face uh, -face experience with students, but when that goes away and you're in a virtual environment, in a remote environment, how are you delivering uh, the same, uh, at just as good service to students? Uh, how are you ensuring that your mission and your vision of your institution is coming across to your students in a remote way? It's, 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 it's a different, uh, yes, it's the same content, uh, but it's delivered differently, and you have to have an awareness of it. Everybody, you know, I, I spent so much time when I was still at an institution just trying to train people uh, a bit on on just using it. But that's half the battle. Understanding the controls is one thing, but uh, communicating effectively and teaching and and learning and making students feel like they're getting value from their education. That's, that's the hard part that a lot of institutions have to learn over the next few years. The other big thing is security. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I, you know the, the security has been under addressed in many institutions. And they, I think higher ed has felt a little immune to that. Uh, but but uh, more and more, we see institutions are, are, are hacked and, uh, and, and that the threats come from the inside as well as the outside. And so there's so much for IT security training that has to be done with employees as well as students because anybody on the inside of the network can make one click on and, and, and suddenly uh, you have ransomware that's holding you hostage and you don't know if you can go open for business tomorrow. Uh, so so it's, it's planning uh, and, and, and it sounds like a lot of work, but really there's just some fundamentals that a lot of schools have to put in place. And I think that goes to 80% of the way there. And then the rest, you know, uh, can, can, you can take the time and, and, and work, on, uh, work on that. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. I want to circle back to the very beginning. So um, one of the things that um, to me is very prevalent is how white higher education is, how white most things are, but how yeah. white and then white male dominated everything is. And right. so I started out in IT, like I said, when I was 17 years old, and I cannot tell you how many uh, white people I faced down just to do my job. And so here we are in 2021, mm -hmm. 
you know, we saw the death of Mr. Floyd, you know, mm -hmm. make some white people become or want to become more aware because they were kind of surprised that this was going on. Whereas most of us in the black community and probably a good portion of us in the brown community knew this had been going on and had never stopped since slavery, you know, it just moved to a different kind of right. But how do you propose to address uh, the lack of diversity in, 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 and when I say diversity, I'm not talking about necessarily skin color. I'm talking about the lack of ideas and thoughts from different minds. So if you as a male think this and I as a female think this, how do you bring together an environment that kind of breaks up that, that log jam of what's been a white male dominated field for such a long time? And specifically in education, because if we're holding out education as a hope for a better tomorrow, for a more prosperous, prosperous society, then it must be welcoming in a way that it has not been to date. Right. Um, I think you know the first thing that is, is is awareness. You know, and I just go back to when when I started learning about the world. You know, in in, in school, I, I feel like. The, the world needs an awareness uh, that, uh, you know, especially that like, like racism is a social construct, right? Like, like let's, you know, you, you have to think about the way you're thinking. And, and so, like you said, it's gonna take time and uh, boy, you know, we just see struggles every day still. I mean, it's 2021 for God's sake, seriously. Um, you know, uh, ha having been born into civil unrest, a world of that, and it's still going on. And you would think by the time I got to this age, it would be better. But what the heck, man? You know, like I, I just don't understand that lack of awareness. So, you know, one thing I, you know, of course I read, you know, you always read about the, you know, one thing you can count on is man's inhumanity to man, you know, that term, you know, which uh, I've read in so many different places, but it's, it's humans uh, in humanity to humanity, you know, it's just everywhere. Uh, I mean, the, the Palestinians and the Israels, I mean, the Israelis, they, they, they're still having a conflict. They can't work it out. Um, and, and so in, in terms of white male dominated, talk about a sector that's white male dominant, IT, right? Uh, IT, let alone higher ed uh, and a lot of these other sectors. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I've worked with uh, some nonprofits and 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 uh, helped my staff who show great promise and have showed great promise and elevated them just by giving them opportunity. I mean, they're there, they're on staff. Uh, they are minor they were minority staffs, uh, and they were elevated because they just took it and ran with it. They didn't have the opportunity or know they could get the opportunity. So I think. Um, you know, it's not enough for uh, white people just to be aware there's a uh, race problem in the country, uh, that, that uh, you know, there's a civil rights problem in the country. Uh, when, when you start understanding that it's encoded, not just in our programs, uh, but in every aspect of society and, the, and people's minds, you know, so it's not enough just to get the software correct. We got to get the minds correct. How do we do that? We talk about it. We get the word out there. We explain it to people. We try to change the minds. Um, so you know, I I, I know uh, there's no uh, probably immediate solution because changing minds is difficult. But I think the more we talk about it, the more we educate people, the more more of us talk about it. And we you know, white people can't assume they understand those struggles because you know if we talk about privilege. You know, and you grew up with that. Well, that's a perspective you never had, but you can be aware of it and you can embrace that and do something about trying to change that and not just trying to change. I mean, you have to change it. And, and so we need to partner together to do this. And, and so in my way, in my contribution is just what I know, you know, which is, which is technology, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying there, but like I said, it's, it's, you know, especially in the past couple of years, the, the awareness of how bad it is in this day and age is mind boggling. And so, you know, what do we do? Uh, but we start talking about it and, and bringing it to the surface and start fixing each and every one of these things. And it might, might not be 100% on every one of them, but awareness is the first step.
It absolutely is. And we got to keep talking about it. And I think we're doing a good job of talking about it, but there needs to be more. And the more we talk about it, I think the more we can change our minds and people will understand. It's like going to school. You know, it's like my experience going to school. I didn't know until I went to school. And then they started pounding things in my head. And I'm like, yes, that's right. I thought it was this way, but it's that way. And so we kind of have to teach people, you know, us as teachers, us as awareness, um, have to try to explain it to them and, and, and convince them, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, this is the right thing. This is the right way to be. Thank you for that. I, I think that we, I think maybe underneath all those things you said, so there's a civil rights problem, a racism problem. I think there's simply an economics problem. We have oh, yeah. economics of how we see each other and why it's necessary for us to segregate segment and segregate people into categories and labels so you know people are been making a big deal about these pronouns which i think is more labeling in a way because i don't know what that means so if i'm if i've got my pronouns does that mean i don't like men what does that mean right so i right. think that's more of an but i do think the problem lies economically because until you pay people and and yes. create an equitable society you know it's just it's gonna we're just gonna circle around the drain I want to say one thing before we go, and I'll give you a few minutes to say anything that we didn't cover. But but I do want to say, as a black person, no more talking. We all know we we don't need you know maybe white people need to talk among themselves, but we don't need any more talking. We know what the problem is. We know how long the problem has existed. Do something. Do something different. You know. So simply, the next time you hire a person, in regards to what their ethnic ethnicity or gender is. Pay them equitably, pay right. them fairly so that you aren't looking back talking about pay inequality or gender inequality or religious inequality, whatever it is that you're, fix the problem every time you can now, as opposed to you know talking about this. So fix it now and fix it incrementally until you fix the whole thing. And so if you've got, if you hired people 10 years ago, black, brown, blue, green, orange, white, whatever color they are, pay them equitably. If you can't bring their salaries up or if you can't promote them equitably, work on it. Create a plan to do it. You know, uh, one of the things I do with my company is I help companies do that, you know, so you don't have to bite the whole elephant at one time, one small bite at a time. So I appreciate this very, very much. I am very grateful for you doing this and I wanna leave the remaining five minutes to you to say anything that we may or may not have covered. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I just wanted to kind of follow up on your economic uh, mention. You're, you're absolutely right. There's a huge disparity that we, we've heard about uh, the disparity in, in the pay between men and women for years. Um, but there certainly is, you know, and, and I, the pay I, between black and white, brown and white, you know, yep. yeah. Ab absolutely. There, there are so many uh, pay differences. And, and, and why, you know, th that's a great question. Like, why would you pay a systems administrator less money because they were female or because they were black? You know, uh, I, I don't understand. I'm paying for you to do the job. So if you come in, you can do the job, you get to pay for the position. Uh, so, so there should not be that differentiation uh, for, for sure. And I, I work with a, a nonprofit Pennsylvania uh, network uh, that was funded by the state of Pennsylvania in 2010 uh, that goes across all uh, east to west in Pennsylvania. Uh, and, and the idea was that uh, it was supposed to bring internet access and network access to Pennsylvanians. Well, guess where the connections were set up? Uh, very large universities, large hospitals, uh, you know, very, very uh, prestigious, uh, you know, institutions were able to afford to make the connection to this network. And so I, I, I joined the board through uh, another consortium that I served on uh, at, at representing the consortium, which is uh, 90, about 100 uh, small schools and colleges in PA. And, and the idea uh, is for me to be on the board, I'm a pain because I am constantly lobbying for these uh, remote small schools out in Western Pennsylvania that are off the beaten trail and do not have access to the internet. Uh, so how, do, how are we going to do that? How are we going to change the mission of this nonprofit uh, to serve them? And, and, and uh, you know, the Biden has, uh, you know, really started work 
now this administration's working on the uh, infrastructure uh, plan for our country, which I think is a great idea. And they're definitely gonna focus on uh, uh, the network uh, and, and internet access for, for people. Everybody should have access to it, everyone. And uh, it's not a rich or a poor or a white and a black or a male and a female situation. It's like everybody should have it. And so I think it's, it's great that we're going to build out uh, that infrastructure, but it's going to be beyond that too, is we have to get that into the hands of the people uh, also that haven't used it and help them use it and make sure that it brings the same value to them as it does for those who can afford that technology too. There's a heck of a lot of work to do, but um, you know, I, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, there, there is a disparity and, and it is a time for action. And I think we all can have action. Um, uh, but, but I think talking, you say it's not the time for talking, but I think somebody like me, who's talking to other white people about this, who don't often talk that, let's get together for cocktails. Okay, that's great. What are we going to talk about? Oh, what a day I had. And oh, this happened. Oh, and my schnauzer did this. And, you know, and then I'm like, well, can we talk a little bit about techno racism or racism in general? You know, that kind of discussion. And what are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Because I don't know if, you know, so I think there's value to talking because I hope it brings action, I guess is, is, is my point from my perspective. And I think a lot of people think that. Uh, the problem is, is like, if you and I have a disagreement, we can get stuck on a sticking point and we keep regurgitating, regurgitating the conversation over and over again. And after a while we get lost in the conversation. Yes, yes. I, at least for myself, and I speak for no one but myself, we're not asking people to take giant steps or to make massive changes or really write policies or, you know, dump millions of dollars into a place. It's just start small, you know. Yes. Because, you know. A lot of universities just send out an enormous amount of email about these things about racism, anti racism, start the Asian hate, you know, all these things. Great. That's great. Love it that you, you're thinking about it, but you can do much more than think, do, do. Right. So, and I think that one of the important things in this fight, specifically in the area, when you were talking about security earlier, right? So we know how big a problem that is. That's not a small, that's, we've seen universities go dark, right? We've seen, yes. We've, we've seen some pretty terrible things happen as a part of IT security or cybersecurity, however you want to deem it. You know, but we're working on it every day to fix it. Every single day, we're putting every single bit of our energies to keep our companies from going dark, to keep our data from being stolen from us. We're working on it every day. If we put that same kind of interest in equality and yeah. fairness, we yeah. make progress. You know, we are throwing everything we can at the security bug. Let's throw it at some of these other things too. Exactly. Not just just focus on this just one thing, but all of these other areas. And you know, it's a lot of work to do. And I and I think it's going to be a mountain, Mount Everest, or wherever to climb. But we yeah. can do it. We can do it. We just want to do it. We have to be intentional about it, and we have to be headed in that direction as opposed to just this. Because no one has figured out the security bug. There was a, a once a great philosopher said the only thing that's a secure is when you dig a hole, throw it in the ground, put the <laughs> and all that stuff. That's security. Right. There's right. No other, but we're constantly working, and I think that's the same emphasis that we need to we need to give equality. So no, thank I I agree. I, I totally agree. And uh, yeah, action is where it is. And and I, I love the parallel between IT security and and uh, you know the work that we're doing on racism and equality. You know, I I, I, I agree with you. And you're right. There's so many institutions that have the diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion programs now because they're supposed to. But you're right, what is being done about it? And that's why, yes, I love measurable outcomes. What are they doing? What is happening? How are we accomplishing what we set out to do? Well, absolutely. I'm right there with you. And I'm going to look forward to hearing to what you're doing next. And if I can be of help, you know where to find me. Oh, well, same here. I, it was a real pleasure talking with you today. And I appreciate you inviting me uh, to have the discussion. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And you have a very good rest of your week. And I will see All you right. once it converts. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye.